for algorithms. <clears throat> okay, thank you, Dick. Uh, so two, two, two announcements. Uh, first of all, the paper was also with Shang Wateng and Dan Spielman. So that was the full list of authors. And I will not say a word about deep learning today. Don't be worried, uh, unless you want me to. Uh, but you probably shouldn't. Uh, OK, so first of all, yeah, since this is the, like the final lecture uh, in this final open lecture in the semester, and probably the final lecture of the semester, I just want to say that you know, this was an amazing, amazing semester. I think really, really like, you know, you know when we were putting together this proposal for this program, you know, somehow you have an idea but there is something interesting happening and it would be nice to make it work. But you know, only once we started inviting people, essentially like we just created a wish list of all the people we would like to invite and almost all of them said yes, we knew that, okay, there is something really special about to happen. And I can just say that indeed this was true. So honestly, I must admit that as an organizer, once we arrived here, I didn't have to do much. At this point, everything was in autopilot, like there's just the, you know, this, like the collection of the people that we invited, they just were carrying this program forward. So, you know, this was great. And thanks to the Simons uh, Institute for both hosting us at, and also having this kind of cleverance and kind of foresight to actually, like when we applied, usually you apply only for like one of the two semesters, semester slots. And, you know, when we, and that's what we applied for. But essentially at that point, Alistair, probably after consulting it with the rest of the Simons board said, actually, how about you just do the first like Jumbo program where you actually will take both semesters because there is clearly things happening and there is more people to bring in. And, you know, and that was a very good, that was a very good decision. I hope that that's what they think now. Uh, I definitely think so. So now this is a final lecture. So this might be a good occasion for trying to reminisce about what we achieved so far. But probably this would be a bit too early. I think you know, the right time for this will be in a year or so for now. I know there are some interesting things happening, but they are a bit too early to talk about it. So instead, what I decided to do, I tried to use this publicity to somehow sort of like you know, promote a certain view of algorithms, or rather the view I would like to have of all of the algorithms that I believe is very much in line in what this semester is about. And I hope that I will convince you that this is actually something you know, interesting and possible and something that maybe you would be interested in taking on as well. OK, so let me just start without further ado. So the point of start is just you know, this very simple statement that I, I think no one can really contend that algorithm is a great success story. So the fields of algorithm is a great success story. So last 50 years, I really would argue this was like the golden era of algorithms. Okay, so essentially, we had a lot of like we like I think every five years at least we have some like fundamentally new idea that we bring to the field, and these ideas go then on be, like beyond you know Stock Fox publications. They actually influence CS uh, you know CS at large and somehow become now the backbone of CS. So this is all great, and in particular by now you know if you look at these books or you look at the literature in the field, you will discover a true wealth of techniques you know that people can apply and develop, can, can apply to various problems, and somehow you have this like very versatile toolkit that essentially for you know whatever you want to solve, there probably is someone who already developed some interesting, clever approach to that. So that's all great. We should feel very good about that, but you know there is something that you know I think is a little bit missing. So. Uh, just to highlight that, let me just sort of give you my kind of very simplified and very and very kind of uh, subjective view of the field. Okay, so you can view algorithms as a kind of two, and I'm talking about TCS algorithm, by the way, uh, as you know, as the you know two strands of algorithms. So first one is this kind of combinatorial algorithms. And this would be the classic algorithms as, as you know from CLRS or any of the you know, undergrad algorithm classes. So these are all these like classic, uh, you know, classic graph algorithms like Dijkstra or you know, max flow algorithms or you know, data structures and all the fun that we like to be tortured during the Google interviews questions. Okay? So this is the like, classic core of algorithms. But then over years, there was a kind of this different kind of algorithm. This like a bit of a weird kind of algorithm, namely spectral algorithms, where you use things like random walks and linear algebra to do some cool stuff. Okay? So essentially, I must admit that you know, I'm not that old, but I'm old enough to remember where spectral algorithms was something that you know, sort of people did, but not did, like, did not talk too much about. You know, essentially, it was this kind of niche algorithm where you know, it gave some very nice results for very specific context, but it was not something that was viewed as a like you know a major part of education of algorithm education of every researcher. 
Okay, so in particular, I remember when I was starting my studies at PhD studies at MIT, you know, uh, this kind of reading things about random spanning trees or about like, you know, Spielmann tank uh, Laplace and solver was a bit of a guilty pleasure for me. Essentially, this was like just cool math, but I couldn't really comprehend, you know, why would you care about doing this, like, if you want to do algorithms. Of course, then I started reading these papers in more detail and then suddenly things became more and more clear and, you know, that's essentially changed the way this, uh, you know, like essentially, like, you know, in, in time I understood why this is like a very valuable contribution. In particular, in 2014, we had this semestral program at Simons Institute about spectral graph theory, which I think did a lot to solidify this kind of knowledge. In particular, we realized that spectral algorithm is just like a sliver of what we are really trying to do here. And what we really wanted to do and didn't know that was continuous optimization. And somehow once we understood that, well, that was the trigger for this semester, where we said, okay, now we know what we should learn, and now we know the other community that we should connect to, and maybe this is time to you know, bring in these guys, talk to them, and figure out you know, what are the commonalities between us, what can we learn from each other. Okay, and that's exactly the genesis of this program, and that's what we were hoping to achieve. And you know, quite quickly, even before the program happened, it was already became clear that this kind of combination of continuous optimization and computational techniques and data structures actually is a very powerful mix. It gives us, you know, it gives us a, a lot of uh, a lot of power, and in particular, it enables significant progress on certain long-standing questions in algorithms. Okay, and you know, both in the continuous and the and the combinatorial world. But somehow, what I want to focus about, uh, I will talk about some of these developments. But somehow, the focus I want to have is not on what we achieved, but also a certain different impact that I hope this already had and will have on algorithms. So sort of what I want to argue is that, you know, one thing why I really so like this continuous optimization view on algorithms, that is not only because it gives us powerful tools, but also because it gives us a very certain unified and principled way of thinking about algorithmic problems. Okay, so somehow the meta algorithm that I always have in mind, and sort of like if you do algorithm, you realize that sometimes, you know, each problem seems to require like restarting from the beginning. You have to be smart, but in the end, you know, you have to start from scratch if you want to solve a new program. It's a problem. So what I like about continuous optimization is that actually it's completely brain dead. Like essentially, it's clear what has to happen. Okay, that was not an insult. That was actually a praise. I, I view it as a, like I think the highest uh, kind of algorithm will be when everything will be automatic and you will not have to. Essentially, we will be out of jobs. That will be the perfect uh, world for algorithms for me. Uh, so that's why I'm doing deep learning, so I can, uh, I can change my... Uh, <coughs> uh, okay, so what will be the underlying uh, uh, meta-algorithm? So essentially, like, what you do is, again, very simple. You have your problem, just formulate it as a continuous optimization task. Like, cast it as a linear program, unconstrained uh, uh, you know, minimization problem, whatever you like. There is like, a lot of flexibility to do that. Now, you have a continuous optimization task. What do you do? Well, there is plenty of off-the-shelf algorithms to solve it. Just apply it. Well, you already have an algorithm, and you know you didn't have to think much about it already. Of course, you know usually this off-the-shelf algorithm will not be perfect. It will be the best algorithm you can, but still, you know there are principled ways of tweaking it once you understand what you are uh, dealing with and adding some problem-specific uh, insights. But in the end, this is really a meta algorithm that works surprisingly well. In particular, what often happens, if you look at the off-the-shelf application of, the, of this algorithm, you will discover that this corresponds to some like, very hard-earned uh, uh, you know, combinatorial algorithm for a problem. So it really seems to be that you get a lot of shortcuts here. Okay? And actually, this goes even more, even more so because, honestly, if you think of continuous optimization, this is a field of one algorithm. It's a very nice field. It's a field of one algorithm, and the algorithm that I claim is the only algorithm you have to really know is gradient descent method. Okay? So, you know, so there's this one algorithm to rule them out, and please do not confuse it with another very powerful algorithm that I like to, uh, like, I like to use, namely graduate student descent. It was great as well, mm -hmm. but, you know, somehow, you know, it just, not all of us are lucky enough to be able to apply it efficiently. Um, so, sounds insane, yes? Like one algorithm for all the problems, and let's not fool ourselves, it is insane. But it's much less, and the point I want to make in this talk is that this is much less insane than you would actually think, okay? So somehow, what I will do today is I will just show you how this, how this program or this view works out for a couple of problems. So actually, I will spend almost all the time on like I, what I see that is the like largest success story so far for this approach, namely the maximum flow problem. But also, I will touch very briefly on two other problems, uh, namely matrix scaling and balancing and k-server problem, just to show you that this is really not about graph algorithms. This is a much, a much broader uh, phenomenon. 
And somehow, yeah, so this will try to like find the gradient descent as a unifying view on all, th all three of these problems. And somehow the broader message I want to send here is that, you know, for the TCS folks, I want to say you should really not ignore continuous optimization. Actually, I would claim you cannot ignore it because that might be the future and you might be by, you know, not thinking about continuous optimization, not trying to learn it. You might miss out on very important insights in directly things that you'd care about. And also I want to make you the, I want to make the case that's actually not as scary as you can think. So I will essentially give you most of the conceptual underpinnings already in this talk. Hopefully. Now, what is, uh, what is the message I want to send to the continuous optimization folks? I want to tell you is that you should view TCS as a great, you know, rich and stimulating domain where you can actually try to see your tools in action. In particular, this is a domain that can inspire you to also improve your, uh, improve your tools. Okay? And this already has happened, and I expect, I expect that this to happen more and more as we understand these two fields together better. Okay? So this is the message, and now let's see how I will do at delivering it. So let's just start by telling you about the main character in this story, namely gradient descent method. So I just will give you like a very quick and dirty, but actually essentially the essential primer to this method. So what is gradient descent? So gradient descent is an algorithm designed to only one problem, namely unconstrained minimization. So what is unconstrained minimization? Well, essentially you just have a function that is nice, in a sense it's continuous and smooth, and all you want to do is just you want to find the minimum of this function over the domain. That's all you want to do, very simple, but also very powerful because this is very flexible. Now, you know, basic idea is how would you solve this problem? In the simplest way possible. You just apply a continuous greedy improvement. So what does it mean? Well, essentially what you will do is all that you will have to figure out is this core primitive that given some initial solution X, just finds a way to improve it a bit. And then you can just iterate this primitive over and over and over and you will get an algorithm. Okay, so all that we need to understand is just this primitive that takes, you know, given uh, input x, tries to find a new point close to that point, to that initial point that is a bit better from the point of view of minimizing the function f. So how do we go about this? Again, the approach is very simple. All you just have to do is just use Taylor expansion of your function around your point. So that's if you remember from the old times of being subjected to, you know, to linear algebra and analysis, that's exactly what you will be getting there. And you know, you, what you realize about this uh, Taylor expansion, actually you don't really have to understand what it is, except two important insights. So essentially the way to view this Taylor approximation is just as a, as a, an, as a you know, kind of combination of two terms. So one of them is just this linear term that just corresponds to like linear local approximation of f. Okay, so this is just the first two terms. This is a constant and this is just a linear term. Now the second term is just everything else and you can view it as kind of local approximation error, essentially how bad your approximating of your function as a linear function actually is, how much you are missing, okay? And we will always want to think of this approximation as a quadratic function, okay? Specifically, we will assume something uh, that is actually a very useful property, namely beta smoothness, we just assume that this kind of tail is over upper bounded by, you know, by uh, beta over two times the quadratic into displacement, okay? That's, you know, uh, that's the way to, f to, to view it. And the moment you view it, you already know what the algorithm should be. So what should you do? So there's this like, key principle of continuous optimization, which says no matter how nasty your, algorithm, your function is, if you zoom in close enough, it will be become very simple. It will become close to linear. And that's all that we are really doing here. So what do we do? Well, we want to minimize, actually we want to think of our function as a linear function. So what do you do to minimize this linear approximation? Well, essentially you just have to move in the direction of minus gradient. So this is exactly the local steepest decrease direction. So this is the greedy part of the algorithm, okay? So this is, no, you just want to move, if you ask yourself where should I move to, to, re to reduce this uh, value of this function the most, that's the direction to move. Now, how far do you want to go? Well, you need to, like, sort of the thing that you need to do, you need to balance out the error of your linear approximation. So the farther you move, the more error you accumulate. So clearly you want to balance the progress you make with the error that you are actually making. And when you do just very simple math, you will just get that the right step size is one over beta. Okay, so this is the step size. So now, you know, what can we say about this? Well, clearly we now have a, you know, an algorithm. Just the one thing about this algorithm is that essentially once the gradient vanishes, then, you know, we are converging to a point. So this is like a critical point of the function. Question is, you know, what this point is. It's actually, what might happen in general is that this, this, uh, this point is neither a global or even local minimum of the function. So that's a problem in general, and 
again, in deep learning, that's a big problem. Uh, but you know, what do you do in everywhere else than deep learning? Well, there might be not everywhere else, but in, in many, many concepts, actually surprisingly many concepts, what you can do, you can actually assume that your function is also convex. And what it means in our language is that this error in, in, in the linear approximation is actually always on negative. So we can only undershoot, but we never overshoot the value of the function. It turns out that once you have this, everything is great. Essentially, all the you know, critical points become global minima. And essentially, we have a working algorithm. OK? So far, so good. And now the question is, OK, so we know that eventually we will converge. But the question is, like, how, much, how many steps we will need to converge there? And what you can prove with not much work is essentially, if you want to be within epsilon of the optimum value, all you just have to do is just have to essentially take this many iterations. So like there is like beta times r squared over 1 over epsilon, when r, uh, r, uh, when r is essentially the distance of your initial point to the optimum point that you are trying to reach. OK? So uh, this is, you know, uh, this is great. And actually, it turns out that you can make things even better. Namely, if actually you have a stronger condition than just simple convexity, something called strong alpha convexity, so essentially you can also lower bound your error by some quadratic. Okay, then things became even better, and the convergence you are getting is actually you know b over alpha times log r one over epsilon. So essentially, the important thing here is that you know this is a logarithm. So this depends logarithmically on the parameters of the problem. So essentially, you can just you know this is just as fast as you would ever want it to be. And the only thing you have to worry is about this ratio of beta to alpha. Essentially, how how well do you sandwich you know your error between this uh, lower bounding and upper bounding quadratic? So this is usually called as condition number. So essentially, your, as long as your condition number is great, is good, you are, you are converging very, very fast. And this is essentially like, you can think of it as then it's an exact algorithm for a problem. OK? So this is all that I want to tell you about gradient descent for now. So let's just try to see it in action. And as I said, the main uh, domain we will apply it to is the maximum flow problem. So just a quick reminder what the maximum flow problem is. So in this problem, we think of a graph G, which has some capacities on edges and source S and sink T. And essentially, well, all that we really want to do is we just want to find a feasible, a feasible ST flow of maximum value. Okay, so we just want to find a way of sending, you know, of sending stuff from S to T so as, you know, we don't have any leaks and then, you know, we never flow more than the capacity on the edges and then just see, we just want to push as much as possible as we can. So in particular, when the capacities are all one, what you are trying to compute is just the you know, maximum number of arc disjoint ST path in the graph. Okay? So this is the problem, and I'm sure this is not the first time you heard about this. And you know, why do we care about this problem? It's definitely one of the most fundamental graph problems. And you know, the reason is that actually it captures a lot of other optimization problems. So a lot of other optimization problems can be reduced to it. And over the last 50 years, this was a problem that was like extremely intensely studied. Okay, that was one of the problems that we really wanted to understand its complexity. Okay, so what have we found so far? So this would be like a very abbreviated history of the problem. So in the context of sparse graphs, which is sort of the best uh, regime for all these combinatorial approaches to max flow, the picture is very simple, at least to me. So this is like classic era, where we use this kind of purely computer algorithms. And essentially, you know, the, you know, the, the, result of the, you know, the result of all the improvements that we got is that in the end, we have this emerging barrier of n to the 3 halves that we just you know, met already for a unit capacity case in the 70s, but could not improve since then. Okay, so, so that's, the, you know, that's the glory and also end of classical era. And then what happened recently is actually that we somehow did things a bit differently. So instead of using purely computer algorithms, we actually use linear algebra and conducive optimization. And somehow, first, what we did is actually we showed that at least if you cared about undirected graphs and you are okay with an approximate solutions, you can actually beat this uh, n to the 3 halves bound. In fact, you can get a nearly linear time algorithm, okay? Ex except this dependence of 1 over epsilon on, on, on the approximation. And then it turns out that actually, once we understood what happens for this undirected case, we also showed that you can also get an improvement for the directed and exact case. Except, you know, so far the improvement is only for small u, uh, for small, uh, small capacities, in particular capacity being one, and there is still some work to be done to get all the way to nearly linear. Okay? So this is all like very interesting work, and, you know, uh, there is, I think, a lot of lessons there. But somehow what I want to do today is I just want to, you know, this work is viewed as some, somewhat technical, 
often. And somehow, it, at first, you might look at it, actually, when, we, when you know, me and others were developing it, we somehow, well, I wish we knew continuous optimization then. Because at that time, it looked somewhat ad hoc. Like, things worked, but like somehow, each time it was a surprise that things work, and somehow there was like a big, uh, big, you know, there was a big, uh, of course, uh, you know, big happiness that we made progress, but also a puzzlement, like why did it work? So what I want to do in this talk, I want to give you a view of all of these developments that you can just clearly see as something natural once you actually know how gradient descent works. So this is both, you know, embarrassing, but also like a great way of showing that you should really try to learn neighboring areas because, you know, you might uh, save yourself quite a lot of time by doing so. Actually, like, not all of this was just gradient descent, but essentially gradient descent would just make it much easier and then there were some additional insights that, you know, you would know, uh, like, what you need and how it works. Okay? So let me try to do this. So essentially, let's try to think about max flow algorithms that don't use the traditional argumenting path framework, but actually try to compute electrical flow, uh, sorry, try to compute maximum flow using, uh, well, essentially continuous optimization. So how, we, how would we go about that? And for now, I will just focus on the undirected variant of the problem. Okay? So how would we go about solving max flow using gradient descent? Well, we don't have to be smart. I already told you what is the algorithm. So step number one, let's just cast max flow as a continuous optimization problem. So how about the following way? So clearly the language of uh, continuous optimization is linear algebra. So let's just try to view uh, the flow as a linear algebraic object, namely a vector. So essentially we just view f as an n-dimensional vector in which like each coordinate corresponds to one of the edges. And now the sign of this coordinate tells us the direction and the value, uh, like the absolute value of it tells us how much flow we flow. Clearly, you know, this is just a moment of thinking. You can encode any flow in this way, and essentially, you know, and this this is the kind of lossless uh, description of the you know, of the problem. So that's great. So now, once you you know, uh, once you know how to think of the flow in linear algebraic fashion, you just want to phrase it as an optimization problem. So what you do? Well, here is one way to do it. So what you would like is you would like to optimize over all the vectors that encode a unit ST flow. Okay, so what you would like to, so essentially like a flow whose demands are zero everywhere on S and T, X and, and one at S and minus one at T. And then what you would like to minimize over all the such flows, you would like to minimize the flow on the maximum, uh, on the, on, on, like the maximum flow on an edge. Okay, so we are talking about the unit capacity flow here, by the way. I forgot to mention that. Okay, so why this is the right formulation? Well, you just have to think about it for a moment. So essentially, like the nice shortcut notation for this maximum of the flow is just L infinity norm of this vector. Okay, and now if you think about it, essentially like the optimum value of this program will be essentially one over the value of max flow. Okay, so essentially you can, f you can think of like the optimum solution to the maximum flow if you just scale it down to just make it be a, you know, a un unit ST flow, you will get exactly the optimum solution here. So essentially this is really up to rescaling, this is indeed solving the maximum flow problem. Okay, so far so good. So now we sort of, now we sort of phrase our problem as a continuous optimization problem. So, uh, <clears throat> you know, so, so that's way to, one way to, f to form this problem. But here will be a bit maybe less intuitive, but actually a nicer way to do it. So the other way we can actually formulate this problem is just to think about it as minimizing over all the vectors. Now it's unconstrained minimization. What we minimize, we minimize an infinity norm of the projection of F onto the space of unit ST flows. So if you think about it, uni the, the space of all the unit ST flows is just an affine subspace of the whole space. And you, know, you can essentially just define a projection on this space. So essentially now you can, you allow F to be w like whatever you want, but then before you evaluate it using an infinity norm, you just project it on the closest point in the, you know, on the closest point that is a unit ST flow. Okay, so this may look a bit more contrived, but it's essentially the same problem, it will be more, more convenient to work with. So now, you know, this is the problem you want to solve. How would we solve it? Well, just think, sorry. So, so let's just think for a moment what it is that we're trying to do. So certainly we, what, the way to think about what we are trying to do is that there is this affine subspace of unit ST flows. And now what we are trying to find, we are trying to find a minimum size uh, L infinity box around the origin that actually intersects with this affine subspace. Okay, that's all that we really want to find. So like this kind of minimum, minimum radius uh, intersection uh, is exactly the maximum flow we are looking for. So now, how should we go about finding this, you know, about finding this uh, intersection? You know, how to solve this problem? Again, you don't have to think. 
there's only one answer. It's gradient descent. Okay, so of course, if you now want to apply gradient descent directly, you will realize that there is some problem, namely, the objective is actually not smooth. So I promise you that the functions we want to minimize are smooth, this one is not. So, but you know, there is again a simple and principled solution for this. All you just do is just smoothen it. So there are general techniques that essentially can take such a you know, non-smooth function, so here is a non-smooth point of this function, and produce a function, other function, that is smooth and approximates your original function as closely as possible. So in the case of, you know, of L infinity norm, the right function to use is just like softmax. It looks nasty, but it's actually very simple. And essentially all you just do is just now, instead of working with your original function, you just work with minimization of the smoothening of this function here. Okay? So now your objective is smooth, and so you know, everything is fine, except now the other problem is, no, how do you actually compute this projection? Okay, so I make you minimize a function, and the problem is that to evaluate this function even, you have to compute this projection. How do you do this? Well, it turns out that again, we are lucky, or maybe there is something more than luck here. It essentially turns out that computing such a projection, so computing the closest flow to a, the closest unit ST flow to a given flow, is actually a well known primitive in different contexts. Namely, this corresponds to computing electrical flows or equivalently solving Laplacian systems. And for that, we actually have this beautiful work of Spielman and Tang, and then all this beautiful simplification afterwards that tell us that you can compute such a projection in nearly linear time. Okay, so we lucked out and actually now evaluating this function and also computing its gradient actually is, you know, is, we can do it very efficiently. So that's great. So now we can run the gradient descent. We have an algorithm, it works. The question is now how fast does it work? So recall that, you know, the key thing that we needed to bound here is the number of iterations of our algorithm. And this was the general bound that we got. So what is beta? Well, you have to compute it for a moment. It's not hard, but like once you do it, you realize that the beta here is one over epsilon. And this one over epsilon comes due to smoothing. So essentially whatever we lose due to the fact that we are smoothening it. And so this is, you know, the, 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 the beta is one over epsilon. How about the R squared? So what is the distance of the initial point? Let's say the all zero solution to the, you know, to the optimum solution. Well, clearly, it is always at most m, yes? Because in the worst case, f star is an optimal solution. It never flows more than one on any of the edges. So clearly, this L2 norm squared would be always at most m. Putting all of this together, we suddenly get, you know, each iteration takes O of m time. So clearly, we have just now m squared over epsilon squared algorithm. So the good news is we just got an algorithm without much thinking, and that's always appreciated. Of course, the problem is that this running time is not great. Now, we definitely know how to solve a max flow faster. But, first of all, you know, what I want to emphasize here is that our approach is principled and robust. Second of all, this was just a generic off-the-shelf off algorithm. Okay? Once we know what we want to do, then it turns out that this framework gives us a lot of power to actually adjust it appropriately. So, essentially, the sort of one of the Key, uh, one of the sort of things we can now uh, take advantage of is actually that gradient descent is a just much broader tool than what I just told you so far. So instead of, so so far, you know, if you look about the, what we happened, so essentially all that was happening is that there was this like sandwiching inequality, okay, for this, uh, for this, you know, for this uh, tail or tail. And, you know, essentially the values of alpha and betas t told us which of the running time bounds we had, okay? Now, the thing here is that, like we didn't know this probably before, but so far I was just using, you know, the Euclidean norm over here, okay? And that was all natural, this is the most natural norm that we know. But actually, there is nothing special about using L2 norm here. You can use any norm you, you know, you, you wish, and everything will work. So the only thing that will change is essentially will change that the direction in the gradient that you will need to take will be a bit different. It will correspond to just so solving of this, you know, of this simple problem. So for the case of L2, this, this solution is just exactly the, the vector itself. So that's why we are moving in direction of minus gradient. For other norms, you actually get a bit different directions. But that's again, very automatic and it's easy to, easy to get. So now, you know, once you know that you can choose whatever norm you want, well, now we can actually think of choosing a norm that makes these parameters alpha and beta as close to each other as possible. Okay? So let's do that for max flow. So it turns out if you think for, about it for a moment, it, it will be clear for a moment why. So the right norm to analyze uh, you know, uh, the gradient descent for max flow is actually not the L2 norm, but actually the L infinity norm. 
Okay? So what happens if you analyze the same algorithm, but from the point of view of an infinity norm? Well, now our radius, our distance from, a, from, you know, from optimum, actually goes, goes down from being m to at most 1. Why? Well, because again, the largest coordinate that we ever will have is 1. And that is exactly the L infinity norm of the, of, the, of, the, of the flow. So this is great. So we went from m to 1. Now, how about beta? Well, beta becomes a bit uh, you know, more difficult now, because actually it is no longer 1 over epsilon. We are losing square root of m. And this just corresponds to the difference between the L2 norm and L infinity norm. So that's what you lose. OK, but this is not m. This is just square root of m. And as a, as a result, the runtime you are getting now is m to the 3 halves over epsilon squared. So again. We, did, did, we didn't do much, and suddenly we are matching already the running time of the best combinatorial algorithms. And again, we are just got started. What can we do next? Well, so one thing that I did actually, so this is the, uh, this is the paper that uh, Dick mentioned, actually we found a way, and you can, uh, we can think of it as just a way of essentially improving this bound a bit. Essentially, like as I told you, the square root of m comes from the difference between L2 norm and L infinity norm. And what you can show is that there is some way of doing the perturbations that actually will enable you to effectively get in m to the one third dependence as opposed to m to the one half. So you are already beating the m to the three half running time. And essentially, there was also a paper by Lee, uh, Rao, and Sirvastava that got similar bound by a different, uh, also gradient descent technique. Okay? So, but yeah, is that all that we can get here uh, when you use different geometry? Well, the answer is no. And this was the insight of, you know, of, uh, of Jonah Sherman and uh, John Kellner. Uh, okay, John Kellner, uh, Yin Tat Lee, uh, Lorenzo Orecchia, and Aaron Seedford. So it says, okay, yes, you can use a different geometry to analyze it, but also you can change the objective too. Instead of using the projection in the L2 norm, you might actually use an objective in L infinity norm. Okay, so what happens if you do that? So essentially, you just like the difference is the same, except now the closest is measured in L infinity norm as opposed to L2 norm. What does change? Well, we still have that the distance to optimum is at most one. That's great. But actually what is nice is that now beta becomes again one over epsilon. So this is great. So the number of iterations is just like one over epsilon squared. So this is essentially you know, really the best we can hope for here in a moment, in a way. So you know, are we done? Well, there is a problem. So the problem is that now, once I change the projection, it actually becomes a different problem to compute, like different algorithmic problem to compute it. In particular, the projection of an all zero vector is exactly the max flow that we are looking for. So clearly, this is not great because you know, we essentially have to solve the problem to solve the problem fast, and that's not the, the right way to do it. However, it, you know, so you might think, okay, uh, is this approach doomed to failure? Well, it turns out that no. So essentially, and this is like a beauty of this kind of approaches, is that what you can do, you don't really need to use exact projection. Just having an approximate projection is totally fine. And what is even better is that the projection, uh, like the approximation factor you, you have, will not be a part of the quality of the solution, but actually it will just in, uh, influence your running time. So you might take longer to converge, but you, the quality of the solution will be still the same. So in particular, in, in some of my works, there was an implicit construction of a you know, m to little o of 1 approximate projection for max flow. And essentially then, you can put it together and get this new linear running time, which then was improved. And actually, recently, Sherman even shaved on one of this power of 1 over epsilon, which was actually interesting from continuous optimization point of view as well. And essentially, we got you know, the best one can get here. Okay? And everything happened in the gradient descent framework. Okay? Great. So this was the undirected case. So let's just talk about the directed case. So how, how, so this was about approximate and undirected case. What does happen in the directed max flow setting? Well, you know, the obvious hope here would be that we can just translate the progress on the approximate and directed max flow to the directed setting uh, right away. Specifically, you know, one thing that should uh, make us sort of happy here is that you can prove that being able to show, to solve exact undirected max flow problem is equivalent to directed max flow problem. So working with directed graphs is totally fine. The only problem is that actually we really need this exact here. And the approximation that we are getting from this method so far is just not sufficient to make this reduction go through. Okay? In, in a sense, this like smoothening and the approximate projection just lose too much information about the function to get exact solutions. 
Okay, so what is the idea? Well, again, you don't have to be smart. You just look into your continuous optimization uh, book. And what you do is just you realize that there is a way. So what you should do is just you should choose the, change the objective in a way that it makes it nicer and only locally instead of, like, sort of nicer only locally instead of globally. So smoothening, you are trying to make the function globally nice. What you should do instead is just try to make it only locally nice and sort of, you know, and sort of not, but, you know, at the, at the gain of not losing too much in terms of approximation. So there is a method that actually achieves that, and this method is essentially corresponds to solving linear programs using interior point methods. So let's talk briefly about that. So sort of the setup here is just the following. So imagine you have a linear program. And somehow, the difficult constraints here are these feasibility constraints. This is what makes solving this, uh, this program hard. And somehow, the idea underlying the whole, uh, the, the whole question is essentially, well, you want to really turn this you know, constraint minimization question into an unconstrained minimization question that's nice. So the way you do it, you essentially introduce a barrier function that kind of, well, like, it, it, there is like a logarithm of the slack of each of the constraints that essentially explodes whenever you are getting close to violating this constraint. So what happens now, now is that this barrier term uh, like, you know, enforces implicitly the feasibility. And you know, clearly, of course, we are now solving a different uh, problem than, the, than we wanted to, to, to solve. But as long as this kind of proportionality parameter stays positive but becomes small, essentially in the limit, we are getting the solution we are looking for. OK? So, you know, and you can assume that you can even solve this problem for large value of mu, which is not that interesting, but actually will be useful, you know, just easily. Okay? So this is the setup. And now, of course, the natural idea is, now, now we have an unconstrained minimization problem. We just need to minimize this f mu, uh, f mu x to get the optimal solution for, for sufficiently uh, small mu. Then, you know, there is a natural way to solve it, just use gradient descent. And this actually will work as an algorithm, except the condition number might be very bad, and essentially we will not, the algorithm will not be fast enough. So essentially what you do is, uh, this is essentially the last trick in the whole bag of gradient descent uh, methods, namely you try to, as I said, you try to um, uh, manipulate the geometry of the problem to ensure that the condition number is always good. Okay, so how does it, uh, uh, like how does it work? Well essentially this is the most advanced or essentially like the, the last idea in the, in the gradient descent method framework, namely the something called Newton's method. So what's happening here? So recall, you know, this was our Taylor approximation of the function, and our like linear approximation, and then our tail. So if you think about that, is that we, in the end, what we want, we want to find some norm in which we can just sort of sandwich this tail from as a lower and upper quadratic in this norm. Okay? But you know, if you think about how does this tail look like, then you will realize that essentially there is like one best way to choose the norm, so the sandwiching uh, inequality becomes very tight, almost like tautologically. So what you essentially do, you set up this norm to be something called local norm, in which this norm of the vector is given by the Hessian of the function. So essentially this is exactly the term that you have over here. So this is not hard to see that as long as delta is small enough, then this sandwiching, you know, this error term is exactly dominated by exactly this quadratic term, which is exactly the quadratic in the local norm, and you have a condition number close to one, so you, you automatically have rapid convergence. So this is great. You just chose a geometry that makes your, uh, makes your gradient descent converge very, very fast, except there are caveats. So the first caveat is that essentially, like, the question is, like, how small is small enough? Okay, so is actually our distance to optimum small enough for this approximation to hold? Usually not. And the other question is that actually when you compute what is the direction I should move now that corresponds to the steepest direction with respect to this norm, then actually it corresponds to computing the inverse of the Hessian times the gradient. And essentially this in general might be quite slow. Okay, so there are two caveats of like, so Newton method is very nice because it always chooses the best geometry for your problem, except, you know, it's not clear, it's only a local analysis, not a global convergence analysis, mm -hmm. and also, you know, actually taking a step in this norm can be quite expensive. But it turns out that here we can actually make it work. So what you do is essentially you parameterize your problem using this mu, and what you have is you, you just sort of always ensure that you only use Newton's method with whenever this rapid convergence analysis actually does hold. So you start with some optimum solution for some, you know, uh, the LP mu for some large value of mu, 
And now you just gradually improve it. So what you do is just you have your current optimum solution x mu star for some value of mu, and then you use Newton's method to find an optimum solution x mu prime star for some smaller mu prime that is chosen to be, well, smaller, but that's sufficiently large. So actually, you know, the new, the new optimum solution is close to your initial solution, and this rapid convergence of Newton's method actually works. Okay, so this is the sort of the theory, but here is the picture to have. So if this is the feasible region of your LP that you are trying to minimize over, so what you, re and this is the cost, and this is the optimum solution, so what you are doing is that essentially, well, if you look at this solution x mu star for all these values of mu from zero all the way to the infinity, then it will correspond to somehow a path in the feasible space that starts at something called like analytic center of this feasible region, and then as mu gets smaller and smaller and smaller, it converges towards the optimum. And now all that we really are doing by this kind of, you know, this successive uses of Newton's method, we are just trying to follow this curve in a discrete fashion. And essentially the length of this step is just dictated by the, you know, how far can we go so this rapid convergence of Newton's method is still valid. Okay, so this is the idea and this is how these things work. So this is how you solve linear programs using triple methods. Now the question is, can it give us a, max, a faster max flow algorithm? And you know, the conventional wisdom, if you ask people like some time ago, would say, no way, this will be too slow. It will work, of course, but it will be too slow. And somehow the problem with exactly what I told you is that in each step, you have to sort of compute you know, the, uh, like the, the product of a gradient times the inverse of the Hessian, which corresponds to solving a linear system in the Hessian. And this is, uh, you know, this is usually very, very expensive. However, Dijk and Spielman notice that in whenever you solve maximum flow problem, then the Hessian of your function is actually a Laplacian matrix. And you can use these fast uh, Laplacian solvers to implement this step to be very fast. So suddenly, this problem is no longer a problem. So now, the only question that remains is, okay, so we know that each step is fast. The question is now, how many steps do we need to actually converge? And this was, you know, uh, one of the central questions in, and still is one of the central questions in mathematical programming. In, par in particular, Jim Renegar showed that, and this is still the current, essentially, well, almost, the, the, well, the best current bound. It says that essentially the number of iterations you need is roughly square root of m times log 1 over epsilon. So when you put it together, this gives you an m to the 3 halves algorithm, which exactly coincides with you know, the best known computer algorithms. That was very disappointed to discover. But and you might think that this is the dead end. And, but turns out to be not the case. So what turns out is that some time ago I showed that there is kind of perturbation techniques that allows you to speed up the convergence of interior point methods. There is though a big caveat that in order to get the speed up, I actually have to perturb also the cost function. So I will solve an, I will solve you know, arbitrary linear program faster, except the program I will solve will not be the program you gave me. So this is a method of a limited useful, usefulness Still, for max flow, it actually gives us improvement. And also, a more sophisticated variant of it due to uh, Lee and uh, Seedford actually showed that you can gain something here permanently for all the linear programs. Namely, you can change this m to be just n. So essentially, instead of number of inequalities, you can essentially get just the dimension of the problem, which is always smaller. OK? Great. So this is essentially almost all of the technical stuff I have to say today. So one point that I want to make here is that essentially this, you know, if you look at the way I talked about this maximum flow algorithm, there was this kind of narrative of there are this classical algorithm and there are this modern algorithm. So the classical one are like things like augmenting paths. They are purely combinatorial, greedy, and simple. And then there is this, you know, and some could say natural. And then there's this weird interior parameter stuff that sort of is clearly like continuous linear algebra, is greedy, but in a sophisticated manner, and not simple and not natural, at least to many people, including some of my colleagues uh, that I co-taught a class with. Okay, so you might say, okay, so this is like very divisive view of things, and you know, is it actually the right way to think about it? And you know, what I actually showed is that not really. So even though the algorithm that I to told you about uses the repo method, what you can do, actually, you can find an algorithm that works purely in the augmenting path framework. So you can get an augmenting path framework based algorithm that gives you a similar running time. In fact, a bit, a, a bit better, it just uses some strange things that actually come as an inspiration from interior methods. But this is a completely legit augmenting path algorithm. So, you know, augmenting path algorithms are still, you know, still the best one. 
And somehow what is even more interesting is actually when you look at what this algorithm is doing, and you look at the previous augmenting path, uh, previous best algorithm path uh, algorithms, then you realize that our algorithm can be viewed as a more sophisticated version of whatever was done before. So clearly, in a sense, you know, this kind of, you know, this kind of disjointness of classic and modern methods here is actually very illusionary. And yet we are talking about very similar concepts and I find it quite, uh, quite fascinating. So you can actually look back and see it in, Monik, it in many classic computational algorithms for max flow and view them through the lens of continuous optimization as well. Okay? So this is all that I wanted to talk about max flow. So since I have only five minutes, so let me just very quickly talk about some other, uh, other instances. And this is only because I want to show you that this is really not about max flow. This is a much broader phenomena. So one set of problems that I wanted to mention is exactly matrix scaling and, uh, and matrix balancing. So in matrix, maybe I would just skip through it. But like the point is that there are just some very simple primitives. Like, so this is some kind of preprocessing step in linear algebra that actually turned out to be very important and useful in certain linear algebraic concepts. So in particular, they have been heavily studied in scientific computing for the last 50 years or so. Okay, and you know they are implemented in you know in, in, in many li libraries because this is really how you press process processor things when you want to do eigenvalue computation or you want uh, to solve linear system. And you know they also have application in TCS like detecting perfect matchings and approximating permanent. So these are clearly you know uh, clearly problems you might care about, and there is even some nice connection to analytical flow. You can view them as a generalization of analytical flow. So you know, these are problem interesting, and the question now is, you know, how do you solve them? So as I said, there was like 50 years of work on this problem, but what it turns out is that actually the right approach, by now right approach to us, is to essentially, again, use continuous optimization. So you can view both of these problems as, you know, just approach solving them by just viewing, uh, you know, like just by just solving certain unconstrained minimization problems. So you just set up a problem, and you just apply gradient descent to it. What, you will what will happen is that this will recover classic algorithms for these problems that were known before. And this will give you good dependence on one parameter, but it will not allow you to, com to compute like optimal solutions. And it turns out that, this, uh, that once you use you know, the next step one, so you know that you can get fast algorithms that are approximate, then you do Newton's method, and you again get, you know, you again get algorithms that are actually exact. So essentially what, you, what happens is, once again, the Hessian of this function you have to minimize is again a Laplacian matrix. So each step you can implement it quickly. And then the only thing that you are missing is essentially you need to find a way in which you use this kind of Newton step to make more progress. So essentially just, I will just show you the picture because that's all, all that I really wanted to show you here is that, so what you do now is that whenever you have your current point, so this is the optimum point and this is the current point, what you do is just you just consider the neighborhood of this point in which this Hessian essentially remains unchanged. Okay? So essentially this corresponds to the quadratic approximation of the function, so essentially the first two terms of the Taylor expansion to roughly remain unchanged uh, like in, in all of this neighborhood of this point. And then what you do, you just find the minimizer of this function in this neighborhood and go in that direction. This of course might not directly bring you closer to the optimum solution because what you probably would like to do, you just would like to move in this direction, but you can show that this brings you more enough. And essentially you can show that, you know, after not too many iterations, uh, you uh, actually get, you know, get to the right solution. So there are two independent works that actually use very similar insights. And in the end, so, so, so this is, uh, well, this is work with Michael Cohen uh, and Dimitris Tsipras, my student, and Adrian Vladu, also my student. Uh, and essentially you can get a near linear running time. And I will not explain what near linear here means. But like the sort of the point here is that in the end, everything is gradient descent. This is the way once you suddenly get a, like a very nice and obvious algorithms and in some sense close to optimum running time. Okay, so that's the last slide that I have on any, anything technical is the yet another domain, namely case server problem, which if you know anything about online algorithms, this is you know, one of the most prominent problems in that field. And it was like heavily studied, but not very yet, uh, not, not well understood by any chance. And I think everyone agrees with me that. So there were some work so far, but you know, somehow the golden standard we want to get to, we want to have like for randomized algorithms, we want to get like polylog competitiveness and we achieved something like that before. But somehow the thing that I really didn't like, even though I was a co-author, I didn't like about it, it was just somewhat ad hoc and it was very hard to generalize. Like it worked, but you didn't really know why. Well, you could see the proof, but that wasn't the satisfactory explanation. 
So what we did, uh, what we did recently with Sebastian Bubeck, Michael Cohen, uh, James Lee, and the Intat Lee is actually we figured out the, I think, what I believe to be the right way of thinking about this problem. And again, the view turns out to be the gradient or mirror descent view of this problem. So what we get is that now, once we talk about mirror descent, well, or gradient descent, the general algorithm is obvious. It's mirror descent. The only problem-specific part is choice of, the, of a mirror map, which corresponds to something like choosing the right norm to you know, the right geometry. It turns out that you know, if you use some, something called multi-scale uh, relative entropy, it will give you an improved running time bound. And in fact, you know, concurrently, James Lee also showed that there is even a different mirror map that gives you a purely polylog k dependence. So again, it's not about the result here, it's just about the view. That essentially this was again a view that enabled us to, to see you know, online algorithms, like one of the most particular online algorithms, from the point of view of continuous optimization. And again, I don't have time to say more. I think this is a view that can actually apply to much broader class of online problems as well. Okay, so let me just conclude and talk about the bigger picture here. So I hope I made some kind of case that continuous optimization slash gradient descent gives us a new and powerful perspective on algorithms, at least some of the algorithms, but again, I, I, I claim this applies more broadly. And somehow the important feature that I really, really, really like is that it is principle and robust. You know, you have a general obvious method, and then you just have to have a little bit of an art to just fine tune it and improve it. But somehow the, the point of start is always clear, and psychologically I think this is very important. Uh, interestingly, it turns out that once you cast things in this framework, a lot of previous solutions turn out to be actual instantiation of it, even though you know, no one thought about it at that time, but in the end it turns out that usually the natural way to do things with gradient descent turns out to be what someone fought hard about to actually get. And this is actually quite amazing, and somehow I, I, really, I really like this point. And somehow the key thing to actually to do, to this is more to continuous optimization people, that somehow the very important part that actually makes it work is that we actually have this very fast data structure and very fast algorithms for solving some of the primitives, linear algebraic primitives, that underlie all of it, like Laplace and solvers or something like that. So there's really like both sides really have to contribute to really make it work. So now the question to you is, you know, how does this change the landscape of algorithms? So in particular, you know, one homework I would like to have for all of you, and I really mean it, is whatever you do, think hard if, you know, maybe it might seem crazy at the beginning, but think hard, could I view it as a gradient descent kind of algorithm? Like again, at first it might seem crazy, but then, you know, now there is many examples, like sparsification can be viewed as a gradient descent, you know. Um, okay, some other things that are in works also can be viewed as a gradient descent. So this is actually quite surprising how many things you can cast in this framework, even though at first you would think that this is completely, these things should not be applicable. Okay? And it's not only about solving TCS problem, it's actually this, you know, this, this work touches on like very core questions for optimization too. So in particular, you know, interrupt method iteration bounds and so on and so on. And we already had a lot of progress in this, in, in this context, exactly when we studied concrete TCS problems from this domain. So, and you know, my major gripe here is actually why the heck we don't teach gradient descent to our student in algorithms class. So, you know, I try to change at MIT, you know, I, 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 I teach undergrad algorithms and then I insist on, you know, on having units of, on gradient descent there as well. But somehow, you know, clearly none of the three major books on algorithms has anything about continuous optimization or gradient descent. And I really think this has to change, and not only because of deep learning. Um, so, so I think this is really important because we are like robbing the students of, you know, very important part of algorithmic knowledge. You know, I wish someone told me about this when I was an undergrad. No one did. Okay, so finally, just this is the shout out to the people in the program. So somehow, yes, we spent the semester, a very enjoyable semester together. And you might say, okay, our job here was bridging stuff. And we definitely started, but we hardly ended. Okay, so I think that only now, you know, I hope we will go back to our universities. You know, we will relax while teaching and doing all this, all this great stuff. That will be the time when we really have, you know, like, have, have the moment to think about how to sort of get the insight that we acquired during this interaction in, in like at Simon's Institute to actually you know have some new and great results. So I hope that's what will happen. Thank you. Thank you.